Hey guys, welcome to episode number 18 of the Friday Frosters. Today, our episode is titled Walking the Type Rope Wire Card. <laughs> so that means we're going to be talking about wire card today. Joe, how are you? I'm great. This is like our second live today, right? I was like, wait, it's like deja vu. I've seen you once today, Robert. Right. And it, you know, it's, I don't know. This is getting really fun for me. I'm having a good time if you can't tell. This is, I'm just so amazed. Kelly, can we hear hey. you now? Yes. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> so I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm so excited because for a few minutes there, we could not hear Kelly. And we thought that we were going to have to, at least I thought I was going to have to sit here and try and think up stuff to say while Joe actually carried the show today. So that was that was scary. No, but seriously, Joe, Joe came in at about a minute uh, till today, you guys. And she was like, were you nervous? I said, yeah, I was just practicing my speech about how bad today's show was going to suck without the two of you. Sorry to hear you, Robert. Sorry. So, <laughs> hey, so look, guys, Mark is here already. Mark says, welcome all. Hope you're having a great Friday. He also said, thank you to the three of you for get dedicating your time and efforts to this. Hey, Mark, man, we, we love it. And honestly, it's people like you that make it fun as well. Heather is doing something today that I'm not quite. Oh, oh it, it must be hot in Florida. Those are thermometers. Oh, oh, wow. And Shelby is here. Shelby, you're in South Africa, right? I think, I'm, I, think I got that right. And Bonita Lee is here. Bonita, what's going on? Now, Bonita just had an event last night, the B2B, uh, what are we, B2B Mingle. Bonita, sorry, I had to leave a little bit early, had something pop up, you know, sometimes things just pop up. But I had a good time while I was there. Joe, you were there. How was the event? I thought it was great. I couldn't stay the whole time either, but I, they, I love the idea. They had a, what, it was about a 10 minute keynote and I think what a what a great model for networking. I just loved that. I told Benita already. I loved that. It's like ten minutes of motivation, and then talking to people about it. So I thought, what a cool cool idea. Yeah, yeah. Pozo says hi, and Pozo is smiling today. And Hal says, "Hola, hola, cómo está, my friend?" <laughs> Benita, we've got merch. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> And Dan, who could forget Dan from Houston? And Shelby said, yes, correct. South Africa. I thought so. And Lokish, good old Lokish, man. He's always here. You got to love Lokish. And Benita, what's the deal with the hearts? Are you loving us today or are we loving you? I don't know. Whichever one it is, we're all, it's all love. And Jacina is here again and she says, hi guys. And she is cool today. So look, you know what? I may not have to give the speech today, right? You know, the when you enter the room, drop the emoji into the chat that signifies the mood that you are in right now. I think everybody's got that by now. So we'll just go on with the spill of Friday Fraudster. You guys, we are on every podcasting platform except Apple. <clears throat> I, I tried to say that softly. Did I? Um, you know, a lot of you guys are listening to the podcast and I, I just want to say thank you. There are a few people who listen on their Alexa devices. I can actually tell, you know, who's listening and where from. There's a large audience in India. And for that, we thank you guys. There's a huge audience in South Africa and uh, either Nigeria or Zimbabwe. I can't remember which one now. Um, and, and actually, the Indian audience right now is out, outpacing the U.S. audience. That's pretty interesting. But while we're here next week, the Innovative Auditor Challenge. You guys are probably tired of hearing me say this this week. It is one spectacular event. One hour each day. Five different presenters. Five different topics. Five hours of CPE for $25. We hope to see you guys there. But today we are talking about walking the tightrope wire card. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I'm the only one that gets a, that's getting a kick out of that. But sometimes you have to laugh at yourself. So, okay, man, this is, uh, wow. Let's just dive right in. So today we're going to talk about Wirecard, in case you didn't get that not so subtle hint. Wirecard is now insolvent, meaning it is no longer around. It is dead, kaput. It is no longer a thriving entity. I guess I'll stop now. 
it was a German payment processor and a financial services provider. It was actually founded in 2008. And it actually survived the financial crash of the 2000. Now, here, here's the thing. It was a fully licensed and accredited German bank, and it offered customers electronic payment services and uh, risk <clears throat> management. I think that's ironic, but, you know. Um, it also issued and, and, and processed physical bank cards. One thing that I thought was interesting about them was they catered to some of those hard to cater to industries like the cannabis industry and apparently the 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 um, uh, pornography industry and other industries like that. Um, I think that those industries need to have banking services. And I think that it's horrible that uh, a lot of banks won't cater to them. I mean, it's, it's their business. Right. But. Before they became insolvent, ENY, their external auditors, previously sounded the alarm during the 2019 audit, financial statement audit, which showed that the firm could not account for 1.9 billion euros, which is approximately 2.1 billion US dollars. The 1.9 billion was supposed to have been held in two banks in the Philippines, but the Central Bank for the Philippines confirmed that the money didn't enter their, their financial system at all. Now, CEO Marcus Brom was subsequently detained on suspicion of inflating the company's balance sheet and revenues to make it appear stronger than it was. Some of the uh, regulators and, and some of their uh, <clears throat> creditors said the money's gone. Wirecard's creditors have little hope of recovering some of the three and a half billion euros that the firm owes, well, everybody and their brother at this point, right? So, um, again, I think I just said since the announcement of them going insolvent, the, the bank in the Philippines said that that money hadn't come through their system. Here's what Reuters, Reuters I always say that wrong. Reuters, blah, blah, you know what I'm trying to say. Here's what they're saying. They're saying that some sources there are saying that Wirecard faked two thirds of its sales, meaning that there would be no way that they'd be able to repay all of its debt. Hmm notwithstanding the legal charges, the legal fees that it's probably going to face now. Apparently, it owes its creditors three and a half billion, uh, out of which 1.75 came from 15 different banks. OK, so let's let's talk about before we dive real headstrong into this, let's talk about what they're what some of the allegations are. And I'm going to say this. Um, uh, some of you guys are going to say, why is he going into so much detail? What I've learned recently is we have a lot of people that watch us that aren't accountants or auditors. It's surprising, but I have a lot of friends who have said, hey, we like the show. So, OK. What you see up on the screen now is kind of like a representation of what Wirecard was. And uh, I've included the source because there was a really good article written up. So what Wirecard is or was <laughs> They process banking transactions, Wirecard, the company itself. Now, in order to operate outside of Germany and in other areas where they weren't licensed, they use third party acquirers. And that's what you see over to the left at TPA. Those third party acquirers ended up facilitating banking transactions with other parties. And then allegedly those third parties held money that Wirecard should have been able to collect. So Wirecard had some base operations in Germany and other countries where they were licensed, where all of the money was held. Then they used these third party acquirers that held other money and that's the money that's missing, the money that was with the third party acquirers. Okay, so now with that said, there are two different ways that, well, really there's only one way that Wirecard should have been accounting for it, but they were accounting for it a different way. So let me explain what that means. So now, Hopefully you guys can see what's on the screen now. Wirecard was accounting for the money on their books using what's called the gross revenue approach, but they should have been using the net revenue approach. Here's what I mean by that. So when those third party acquirers, let me go back to this, when those third party acquirers had revenue, so if they had revenue of say, hmm, $100, and then they had cost of 30 bucks and $70 was supposed to go to Wirecard, Wirecard would book the $70 as revenue on their books. And then at some point they should have subtracted out the 30 ending with the 70, but Wirecard didn't own these third party acquirers. So that money should have been included on Wirecard's books when they got the money from the third party acquirers at the $70 at the net. So you can see how that overinflates your cash on your balance sheet. So that's one of the issues that they had. 
Another issue that they had was with something called goodwill. So let's talk about what goodwill is. Okay. So goodwill is intangible. You can't see it. You can't touch it. Mm, which means it's kind of squirrely. That's my technical term for it. It's squirrely to account for how much it really is. So goodwill is an intangible asset that's usually associated with the purchase of one company by another. And essentially what it is, is it's the purchase price that is the, the part of the purchase price that's higher than the assets minus liabilities that you bought from someone. So say, for example, if someone was selling a car to me that was worth $10,000, but I said, you know what? I like you, so I'm going to give you $20,000 for the car. On my company's books, the, comp the car would be sitting on my books at $10,000. Then I'd have this line called goodwill, the intangible asset for 10. Now, that's an oversimplification. My friends who are CPAs are going to say, well, that was a stupid example. <laughs> and to that, I say, I don't care. People got the point. <laughs> but, so so now if you look here, what we're looking at now is Wirecard's uh, uh, financial statements from 2015. You can see that they had, what is this, a million dollars in cash. And then Goodwill was two hundred and sixty five million dollars. What the heck is that? Like, seriously, that should have been a red flag from the beginning. Anyway, let me let me stop. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop right here, um, I think. And Kelly and Joe, they're going to dive right in and, and then I'll, I'll come in at some point. But so so what's happened is they've overinflated their financial statements. There's money that should have been at these third party acquirers and these third party acquirers are saying, we don't know what you're talking about. And so now they're insolvent because the money's gone. The money's missing. All right. Uh, well, I've loved the wire card story since June of last year is when I started adding it into my ethics presentation as a big me. I think Marcus Brom is a, it's like the poster child of the big me. Um, and those of you that have been in my ethics knows what that means. People that are out for themselves, right? They're, these Some of the smartest guys in the room will go back to the Enron reference. I think he fits right in. And it wasn't just him. There's a few others. So I'm sure, sure maybe we'll get into the executives there. But anyway, here's what I'm going to say is I found the wire card story fascinating. Number one, because I got to stop talking about Wells Fargo as much and their scandalous <laughs> opening of fraudulent customer accounts. Um, and because this is, you know, I think Wirecard's biggest defense was this was NEY's biggest defense was what a sophisticated fraud this was and that's this was not sufficient that is such a cross right i think we can all agree um so this one really does intrigue me because i think all those people that say this will never happen this doesn't happen it always be caught like this is the per this is like the poster child for big financial frauds on how it can happen be overlooked regulators governments uh auditors i mean it's so many players employees uh, look the other way. And it's amazing that it took so long for this one to come out. Amazing. So what hit me, like when Robert was just talking about this is, okay, they took on like icky customers like porn. Okay. That goes back to WorldCom and Walt Pavlo that, you know, they had assets on the, or, you know, customers that no one else would take. And then it is a simple fraud, but they wanted it to be complicated, just like Madoff, like, oh, this is too complicated for you people to understand this. And it comes down to hashtag, it's not rocket science. Um, Sam Antar also talks about like, this was easy. This isn't like, I mean, there was money moving around the world, but when you listen to, um, oh my God, I'm totally spent, Dan McCrum's presentation on the at the ACF if you can if not there's other stuff on YouTube um he's like there was a uh <laughs> there was the payments company is at a house and he said surely people will see now these people chose not to see again it's like Madoff had his accountant was in a strip mall like there is a guy and I think it's um there's there's a movie and it's muddy waters research and they go and they do stuff in like due diligence in China and they will, you know, literally see how many trucks are going in and out of a factory. 
this is due diligence at its basics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it hashtag it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and then also the um, I love your the big me masters of the universe. And it's like, oh, you can't understand this. Oh, please give mm -hmm. us a break. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yep. soapbox. <laughs> well, no, no, your, your soapbox is great because, uh, so let's check out Hal, because you got to love our audience, especially Hal. Hal says, per EY Germany, here's, here's a quote, there was a group of criminals that managed to deceive everyone, including us at EY. This has damaged EY, but also the profession as a whole. And Hal says, and I agree, OBS, now check out Dan. Dan says, EY failed at the most simple process, confirmation of cash. So let me go back and show you guys just how simple this really was. So, okay. Oh, wait, let me get Dan off the screen really quickly here. So now you see here where it says EY scope of the audit was wire card. And remember, we talked about these third parties that they were using. What EY failed to do for several years was like Dan said, do simple cash confirmation, go out directly to these banks where one and a half billion dollars or pounds euros, I'm sorry, was being held and asked these banks, how much is the balance on hand? Because now we're hearing that the banks are saying that none of this money ever reached their country. So that's just a simple cash confirmation that the, the most unseasoned auditor straight out of school with your degree, that is the first test that they put you on. So to say that this is sophisticated is a bunch of crap. And I, 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 get, I just get tired of these PR stunts from firms where they if you made a mistake, honestly, for real, just say it. And then I think people would be more forgiving than you insulting our intelligence like this, because we are a lot smarter than this. This is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I, I made me think of it was confirmations and the search for unrecorded liabilities. Those were the two things that we did as first year auditors, right? This is basic things missing. I yeah, agree. But, but even so, if we go back to here, to the goodwill, if yes. I'm looking here and I see 265 million of goodwill on your balance sheet, which outstrips the majority of the rest of your assets and goodwill is an intangible. So now a majority of our balance sheet is made up of some fictitious asset that we can't touch. And nobody said, oh, wait a minute. Oh, let me think about this. This this might not be right. This is the dumbest thing I've seen in a while. And uh, well, it's, it's, so, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm just as not an accountant like you guys. I'm assuming, and you know, you can hit me if I'm wrong, like certain industries have higher goodwill ratios than others or percentages than others. In banks, I'm going to say the goodwill is an incredibly high. But again, this is where like, you know, we, as Scott Galloway and Pivot would say, the idolatry of tech fell into this wire card that, you know, we just, we value tech so incredibly highly. So I don't know, what do you, well, Are there ratios for goodwill for industries? I'm sh I'm sure there is. And I think you bring up that, I mean, a great point, which was hit on in one of the articles that flat out, even the acquisitions were way more than they should have ever been valued at to begin with. So it's right. like, it goes even beyond the goodwill to these acquisitions, which gets at what you're talking about, Kelly. Yeah. Yep. That, that's exactly it. Now, Jacina, Jacina works in banking, I believe. She said lack of fintech knowledge was probably the excuse at the time, not a good excuse now or, or then or now. 100% agree because th this was so simplistic. And besides that, realistically, fintech is really just a new term that we've slapped on an old thing. I mean, banking is still banking. It's still the same. We just call it fintech now because the, the, the technology is a lot more heavily involved. But in 2003, I worked for the U.S.'s first Internet only bank. So we were essentially doing fintech way back then. This is why this is. Nah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm with you, Justina. I'm 100 percent with you. Well, and it, and it gets to just even the way the company was set up in those different countries. You know, they say they use these third party providers to be able to be licensed to deliver in that country or to provide services in that country. Like to me, as you're reading, there's, yes, it might seem sophisticated to those of us that aren't in accounting and see these things be, because they hit on everything, No, you know, but it's, but it's not, it's like, how could we not have, has, have anybody not have caught one of these, you know, 10 red flags that went up or we'll call them white flags, I guess, white, white color crime. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> 
I can guarantee yeah. you that there are some non-accountants who are watching and or listening who understands everything that we just said. So this was not complicated at all. And Hal says that uh, per the article, per that same article, and he's quoting again, the EY auditors didn't ask for any bank statements showing that the money uh, Wirecard claimed was in trust accounts existed. They instead relied on information from the trustees. Now, I want you to think about this. Our entire job as auditors is to go out and verify that things either occurred or that they exist. I mean, literally for financial statement auditors, which is what they are, the external auditors, it's the five assertions, right? Existence, occurrence, uh, whatever the other ones are. Fitness, valuation, <laughs> accuracy, presentation, disclosure, rights and obligations. I just did a matrix. Sorry. So there you go. And Mark said even he understood it, right? I mean, it, it just, but, 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 but. But wait, there's more. God. Billy Mays. I love Billy Mays, you guys. Um, so let's talk about the evolution of this thing and how it all evolved. So as Wirecard collapsed, new villains started to emerge every day. And the media narrative in Germany became murky. So there was missing money in the Philippines, and then there was a shady businessman in Singapore. But starting in early 2010, rumblings about the fishy accounting practices at Wirecard started to build. So approximately seven or eight years ago, the Financial Times reported that the company routinely inflated its assets and the number of transactions that it handled. Now, after breaking the story, the Financial Times rang the alarm again and again and again to the tune of producing about eight articles per year on Wirecard. These articles caused Wirecard's stock to nosedive. And before long, the German regulators actually sprang into action, but they didn't do what you thought they would have done. So the Security and Exchange Commission in Germany began an investigation. <sighs> and what they concluded was that there were a bunch of people colluding, trying to drive down or up the stock price of Wirecard so that they could short the stock. That is what they concluded. Now, in 2019, prosecutors actually tried to indict the Financial Times journalists for stock manipulation. So they actually went after the journalists who broke the story. Okay, then that same regulatory body banned short selling of Wirecard stock. Hmm, sound kind of like uh, <clears throat> somebody robbing in the hood here in the US. <clears throat> then it still gets better. Meanwhile, evidence of the Wirecard uh, scandal debacle kept mounting. Um, in 2019, uh, the Financial Times published pictures of Wirecard, I'm sorry, yeah, they uh, published pictures of Wirecard's partners in the Philippines having a good time. Then Chancellor Angela, Angela Merkel in Germany lobbied for Wirecard's acquisition of a Chinese rival. So they kept doing acquisitions. Then it gets better. It took until spring of 2020 for Wirecard to finally admit that indeed much of the income likely did not exist. Braun, the CEO, resigned and was arrested. So that's kind of the evolution of Somebody kept trying to break the story. The Financial Times kept writing articles. Then the, the Securities and Exchange Commission in Germany tried to prosecute the Financial Times reporter who was writing a majority of the articles. Then they banned the short sale of the stock. <laughs> then they actually condoned further acquisitions from this company that is now missing 1.9 billion euros. What do you guys think about that? And then we'll go into a really good uh, story about a whistleblower. So um, one of the things is, uh, you know, Dan McCrum, well, and I, I wrote something about it. They just went after, again, the whistleblower. They even went after the Times. Um, and it's kind of a too big to fail. But apparently McCrum said that there were, they were looking at buying Deutsche Bank, and they thought if they bought Deutsche Bank, they could hide the $1.9 billion mistake. Yep. And that's really frightening to me that like they go after, you know, Deutsche Bank, which is, I mean, it's Germany. 
It's, you know, and they thought they could just hide it in that. And that's just incredibly frightening. So I don't know, Joe, what do you think about that? No, I, uh, I think it is frightening. What I think is frightening is, again, it's the time period to me. It is the, um, uh, the attempt to bring attention to something that needed attention and it didn't work. Uh, it's a failure on many levels is what I just kept you know, saying as I looked at the timeline and I read about it and, and studied it a little bit, I even write about it in my book. Like there, I mean, this one just had failures on, on almost every level. And it's so, crazy. By the way, which book would that be so that we can get people to go out and get it? Oh, the coming, the everyday ethicist, because this is not your poster child for the everyday ethicist. This is the opposite we're talking about today. I, yeah, we, we, I was trying to find, I think there's one or two other big leaders that are on the run. Did you guys yeah. see anything about that? Okay. Cause I, I was, saw one. Yeah. Okay. At least one. Uh, isn't that, I mean, they're, they're missing. Like that's, it's crazy. So this well, is maybe they should hire one of their 28 private investigators that, that they had on financial times and Dan McCrum and the whistleblower. And maybe they could um, find them that way. Right. There you go. So now what Kelly's talking about is they actually hired PIs, private investigators, to dig up dirt on the journalist at the Financial Times and the whistleblower who came forward because their whole purpose and goal was to besmirch their character so that you would not believe them. So if you could find dirt on them doing other things, maybe you wouldn't believe the things that they were telling you about what was happening here. But let's go back to our audience. Uh, Dan is impressed that Joe knows the financial statement assertions. So am I. Kelly says that Joe is always impressive. And that is very much so true. And Dan says some very bright people there. I mean, I'm sitting under bright lights, but that's probably about it. Now, Jacina says that this sounds like it came from the Theranos School of Fraud. You are so right, my friend. And and, and Shelby is laughing because I said Robin in the hood. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Hal says serial overvalued acquisitions equals a house of cards. And we all know what happens to a house of cards. It falls down. And Dan says, that was a PhD, Jacina, from the Theranos School. And Dan is also correct. WorldCom Part Two. Mm -hmm. Whew, I love that. I love all of those comments. I saw the Theranos one pop up, and it, as soon as you start, you guys brought up the private investigator. I'm like, yep. You know, it's it's whatever we can do to make other people look bad and us look good. You know, blame blame other people. They're just trying to take us down. Yeah, it's all sorts of that. Excuse. Well, oh, so sorry. Um, so the other thing is um, a plug for Great Women in Fraud, Loidette by Mero, and I talked about this in my most recent episode, and she has, if you're not connected with Loidette, um, I'll, I'll put a link in, um, she has a couple of videos about Wirecard, but one, and she's, she's a lawyer, guys, and you know me and lawyers, but Loidette is the investigator's mindset lawyer. And her thing is, and she was talking to someone, when you get a whistleblower, everyone goes to looking at the whistleblower. Stop it. Look at what they bring up first and then look at the whistleblower. Like do the, do what they bring up first. And then yes, you know, you need to, I'm not going to say validate, but how many whistleblowers are, I mean, we're, we, there's always dirt. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's always dirt. But as we get to the whistleblower, I have to say, do what your mama says. So you want to bring that, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, and before we go there, so Hal says politics 101, Joe. And Joe agreed and said, yep, deny and deflect. OK, so I'm going to add one more to that because I call this the 3D effect. They deny, defend and deflect. It's the 3D. I call it the 3Ds. Deny, defend, deflect. And you see it a lot of times. There's also something else that I want to say before we get into the whistleblower. When it comes to whistleblowing, here's where I here's where I want to put the some accountability square on internal auditors. So I told you guys I have a solo podcast coming out next week called Audit Bites. First episode I have titled Auditors Should Always Assess the Aftermath. And I'm talking about whistleblowers. Whenever a whistleblower leaves a company, you need to look and see whenever someone in a high position leaves a company, you need to take a look at what was happening. 
Nobody's just going to leave for no reason. They usually leave because one, they knew something and they were forced out or two, they knew something and they couldn't take it anymore and didn't want to be a part of that trash. And so they just left. Or sometimes three, when somebody leaves a company in a position of authority, maybe they were incompetent, but there are very few people in jobs that are incompetent. So number one, they were forced out because they knew too much. Or number two, they didn't want to be a part of that nonsense. When people started leaving wire card, like this whistleblower did, any internal audit team should have been like, why is our executive member of management leaving abruptly? So <clears throat> Mark said he's going to steal that. As long as you give me credit, I call it 3D. Defend, deny, deflect. And that's what people do, not just when they're stealing. This is what people who have insecurities do. This is it, it also goes into who I call the how dare you people. As soon as you bring up something that's relevant and factual, how dare you talk about this, which is what they did with this whistleblower and these other folks. You have to watch out for 3D people and how dare you people. They're despicable. They are 100 percent despicable because they are not in pursuit of the truth. Oh, boy, I'm really on the road today. I've got to stop. God. How dare you? How dare you? I, I love that one. Yeah, you have to watch for how dare you people. So now let's talk about our whistleblower. His name, I might get wrong. His name is Pav Pav Gill. We'll just call him Gill. Uh, so Gill has to thank his mother for a whole lot of things. Here's what some articles say. They say he was raised, uh, she raised him alone in Singapore's subsidized housing. And don't be confused by that, you guys. A lot of housing in Singapore is subsidized by the government because it's so expensive to live there. I like the way these Anyway, whatever. Pushed him through the city's best schools. And when it came time, forced him to become a whistleblower who would bring down Wirecard's global fraud. So now he says that and I'm quoting him. It wasn't it, it wasn't me, to be clear. I was just trying to look for another job and she was busy trying to find ways to explore, uh, expose, I'm sorry, the company from my sofa in the living room. That is what he said now that he has a new life in Bangkok. So all he was doing was looking for another job. He didn't want to disclose the company, but here's what happened. He was hired at Wirecard September 2017. He was their first in-house lawyer responsible for the Asia Pacific region. Within month, months of starting the job, he was approached by two Wirecard employees who accused colleagues of cooking the books. So this was back in 2017, right? An investigation was launched codenamed Project Tiger. And it focused on a young Indonesian man. So, OK, that's kind of weird. So Project Tiger quickly uncovered the misconduct. Staff were emailing themselves logos, fake contracts and invoices. However, Wirecard's top brass took no action on the suspected perpetrators. Instead, the chief operating officer seized control of the investigation. So let me say, there are some internal auditors who are also in charge of doing investigations. That is the way it should be. But you have to be brave in order to do that. And here's what I will tell you. I was a chief auditor at one organization responsible for doing the investigations. We had so many investigations come in at one point in time that disclosed a lot of things that were happening. Executive management took away the investigations from my unit. You always have to look at that. Auditors should look at what happens in the aftermath of things. So now let's get back to this story. Uh, <laughs> so Gil was shocked and he says, I quote, any normal company, especially a listed company, would have suspended these people, even if it was just for show. So now in September, he was presented with a choice. His choice was either to resign with a positive reference or be fired. Hmm. He's saying that he had he lacked the strength or the resources to fight and felt that he was out of options. Think about this. This was a multi-billion dollar company. He wouldn't have been able to afford to hire an attorney. And mentally, stuff like this takes a toll on you. So you just give up. He said, and I quote again, if the company for three months is showing a tendency to discredit and destroy then the only way to protect yourself is to do what I did. Take some incriminating data just as a shield. So what he's saying is he took the offer to resign and then he took some incriminating data with him so that he could use it at some point in time. Because even though he signed a non-disclosure agreement, I mean, facts are facts. Non-disclosures usually say you won't say anything disparaging about the company. Now, if you present someone with a set of facts, 
that's not disparaging. That's just facts. So now, um, even then, Wirecard might have repaired the situation. He was willing to start a new job elsewhere and forget about the whole affair. Instead, Gill said they tried to destroy me. And I'm quoting him now. They tried to destroy me manfully, professionally and emotionally. That's when they hired these private investigators to go after him. Now, he says he suspected he was being followed. Neighbors reported strange men taking an interest in his apartment. Bad references put pay. Bad references. Uh, 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 yeah. And he said in some job interviews, he felt like there were they were traps to lure him into breaking his non-disclosure agreement because there were excessive questions focusing on the reasons why he left wire card. Now, all of this happened until his mother approached the Financial Times. Um, he said he, he didn't know what to do with the material that he had taken from the company. But then he says, and I quote, if Wirecard's modus operandi is to create fake documents, then you know there's nothing stopping them creating something about you as well. And then he said again, if you go to the police and say this company is trying to destroy me, it sounds like a fanciful tale. And it does, you because you could say that he was paranoid. There are a lot of things that you can say. Another thing that he said was one lesson that he learned was that um, the employees who spot potential misconduct then realize that their employers are not properly investigating it have very few options. So now I'm going to quote him one last time. He says, a lot of times people don't have the full picture. They have a suspicion, but they are not in a position to provide irrefutable evidence. Now, thankfully for him, he was in a position to provide irrefutable evidence. But I'm going to stop right there because all of that is just a huge mouthful. All of that. Well, you're doing a great job, Robert. This one is like the timeline, the complications, the different intricacies. Pat, yeah. And Pat, then Pat. he goes on and he's like his journey, as he calls it, was not without cost. He would get anxious whenever his buildings lift past his floor, making the door rattle. I always used to get scared. Just hearing that door move would not allow me to sleep. I would know that it was not particularly rational, but it still happens. And just like Dan McCrum, it's like a Bourne movie. It's like, you know, Matt Damon in Bourne, where at the last minute he's hopping off the, you know, the tube in London. And you think it's like, Oh my God, he's a lawyer working for a financial institution. This doesn't happen. You are cray cray. No, if you've seen it, you're not cray cray. And again, this goes to people like, well, this would never happen to me. I mean, I, I will tell you personally, my husband is a whistleblower right now and you can't believe this shit. It's just, it's, and people are like, no. And it's because we go around with rose colored glasses. Yep. Yeah. You, you would be surprised if, if, if people knew uh, cause I know Joe, you were uh, a former audit director as well. And you see a lot of things in the company and uh, Heather says, take a breath, Heather. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just fine. Uh, now Jacina says auditors get a backstage pass to the, how dare you show, right? People are going to be stealing the stuff that I say now. Watch yeah. now. Pozo is very surprised. She's like, Oh, wow. Oh boy. And Jacina says, that's, there's that tone at the top problem on full display. Mark says it's called a clue. Yeah. Oh boy. It is called a clue. Now, Jacina says as an attorney, he should have realized that he would have been better shielded by the SEC as a whistleblower. The only problem though, uh, Jacina is that they were, they were tr being traded on the German ex uh, stock exchange, not the SEC. So, uh, and Hal says the firm by John Grisham. That was one of my favorite murder mystery, uh, not murder mystery, uh, mystery books. Grisham is one of my favorite authors. And so is this other woman called named Sandra Brown, my two favorite, uh, fiction writers. But, uh, but yeah, I, and, and, and Kelly hit it on the head. Cause yeah, Kelly's husband is a whistleblower right now. And you, you read some of the articles and you're just like, yeah, this is nonsense. And, and I think for some of us who have been doing this, you can spot the nonsense, especially if a part of your job has been to identify crazy behaviors in people that don't make sense and line up with truth and justice. But not everybody is trained to spot a liar. Um, on the, the note, I know we talk a lot about obviously internal audit of where Robert and I came from. Uh, not, not one of these articles mentions Wirecard internal audit. Yeah. Um, 
does it, Robert? Am I missing nope, in there? Not a single one. And now I don't know a lot. Maybe some of you from other countries outside the U.S. I mean, obviously they were traded on the German stock exchange here. That would equate to we need an internal audit department, most likely public company. Um, so I'm interested if anybody's seen anything about their internal audit department, because again, this is where we all we've been talking about our culture red flags and ethics red flags, and that's what I'm trying to teach and persuade internal auditors to look at, but look at, I mean, obviously would have taken courage. They would have had to have been in that whistleblower place if, you know, if they were the ones that uncovered this over the years. Uh, so I'm not to say they wouldn't come forward, but it, again, it takes just as much courage. But um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because we've talked a lot about the external auditors. And I do have one point from one of the articles that I did want to read uh, whenever you guys want me to about the external auditors. But let's not forget if there was internal auditors, where were they? I know you guys hate it when I say that, but where were the... I don't hate it at all. I love it. Well, it was, here's the other thing in this situation. When you look at a lot of publicly traded companies, they tend to separate out the investigations from internal auditing, which makes absolutely no sense to me. And then the other thing that they tend to do is they tend to get the legal department to do a lot of the investigations. But let's just, again, let me just say your lawyers are your best friend in an organization, right? Because they can keep you out of trouble. But that's just the thing. The lawyer is there to keep the company out of trouble. They're not an independent objective function. Their job is to keep the organization out of trouble. So when you have your legal counsel and your legal department doing investigations, that in and of itself shows that you're not object, or I'm sorry, gives the appearance that you're not objective and independent. Because I'm sure there are lawyers who can be objective and, and independent, but from a transparency standpoint, it doesn't give that perception. And Dan says, where was the board? I have no idea. Like that, that's just- I know where baffling. the board was. I know where the board was. They were on flying, vacation? <laughs> well, they were flying private. They were having meetings in just beautiful places. They were having cocktails and champagnes and they were comparing their watches and like, I, oh yeah. yeah yeah it's just like again pivot podcast and the tech bros and the idolatry and they are making bank well it's all the bank is all gone <laughs> yeah. they, they saw themselves as you know they were gonna profit from it and this is where i want to go to is i would love to be a fly on the wall at ey at obviously wirecard and the board meetings how does I mean, I want to hear the words that they say in these meetings, and we'll never hear the words that they say in these meetings. But like, can you imagine how they justified this? Yeah, so um, a selfish plug for the Innovative Auditor Challenge again. Next Thursday, I'm talking about the seven deadly ethical sins of organizations. And one of them, I've plugged uh, one of them with Robert yesterday. I've, I've mentioned a few here and there just to get people intrigued. But one of them is the lawyers and the auditors approved it. So it must be okay. That's one of the seven deadly ethical sins because, you know, that doesn't mean that it's okay. And I know Kelly and I have some similar opinions on lawyers and I have a very strong opinion on external auditors. Um, and the, the one article said, essentially, there are basically three things that could have been the explanation of EY's failure in this. Number one, they were expressly corrupt, perhaps side payments on the, you know, payments on the side. That's probably worst case, right? Uh, second possibility is they were simply incompetent. Sadly, that is an extreme possibility. Third possibility is that they were somehow culturally conditioned by workplace practices in auditing to look away from such malfeasance in uh, at, at their clients. And I just, I thought when I read that, I was like, wow, that's, um, that's, those are pretty extreme words, uh, or options to use, none of which are good, uh, and just look so bad for our audit profession. And, you know, I know we try to just re distinguish internal from external. Uh, but this article, I posted all the articles in the chat or in the comments. Um, this article in specifically talks about, um, you know, EY's failure. And uh, I just, I don't know. I really liked that article. Yeah. So 
the whistleblower. Wait, let me get back to I just lost my place. Oh, let me get back to E and Y in just a minute. I was going to say something about it because I found something in another article, but I lost my place here. So the whistleblower actually said, here's what he suggested. He suggested that governments create official whistleblowing agencies outside of the police. And he said, and I quote, it can be like uh, suspicious transaction reporting agencies. Individual employees need some agency they can go to and say, I'm really scared. This is what I think my company is doing. Don't use it against me or my company. Just tell me what I should do. Now, I found it interesting that he said this, because if you look at what happened, I mean, when he tried to blow the whistle, the actual governing body for the stock exchange there kind of turned on the Financial Times. And then, I mean, Angela Merkel herself condoned more acquisitions. So I, I, something is really wrong there, you know? And it, this is, again, you know, we make everything, not we, we don't, we make everything so complex and it isn't complex. It is simple. It is due process. It is due diligence. It is, you know, do it now. Like this isn't complicated. And, and it goes back to Sam Antar of Crazy Eddie, you know, decades ago, he goes, we get the young auditors, the ones fresh out of school. And, you know, he had boxes in the warehouse that were empty and they never even opened them. And then he goes, if anyone actually asked a question, I just talk over them. Mm -hmm. And so, and can you imagine when you are a young professional, we're all seasoned and, you know, we've got our walk away funds and everything, but a young professional and you have a mentor and they're just like, oh, don't pay attention to that. Don't open that box. Like we've never done that, you know? We've always done it that, that way. Like uh, fake it till you make it, which was the advice I got my first yeah. year as an auditor. And I tell that story in my ethics training because I said, that's not me and I'm not going to do that. But that is some of the mentality that's out there. And by the way, I saw Hal's comment about uh, they're blinded by fees. Of course they are. So that's why, you know, there's a lot of articles out there on should uh, the public companies, at least in the U.S., should they form an organization to pay auditor fees so it's not coming directly from the client, from the company. you know, from the company? Because you're, are you ever going to bite the hand that feeds you? I mean, that's, right, so, that's it. So now to, to, to Kelly's point about just asking questions, I mean, uh, let me just tell you guys a story about something that happened to me at one point. So. You guys know I'm very transparent. It is what it is. So I inherited this one audit shop that had been auditing this this unit for several years before I got there. And I get there and things just don't seem right. This was a retail unit that had a back back shop operations where they had inventory and stuff. So I walk into the back room and I see this pot of inventory that was shrink wrapped. So my first question to the manager was, why is this stuff in shrink wrap? That was my first question. Well, it's slow moving stuff and we're going to get it out of here and it'll be out of here real soon. Oh, OK. So then I walk over to the stuff and I just simply take my finger, run my finger across it and it's dusty. Now, if you run a retail establishment, there's no way that your back room should be full of stuff with dust. Let me just say the end result in this is that there was over a million dollars in inventory that needed to be written down because it was obsolete. And here I have inherited a staff that had been auditing this for years before I got there. And none of this came to light. Just a simple run your finger across some dust and look at some shrink wrap stuff. Auditors, you've got to do better. You've got to do better. All it takes is just being brave and asking some questions. You've got to do better. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to do things that other people haven't done. You know, I think the, the, the biggest pitfall of auditors is to follow last year's work papers, to do what we did in the prior engagement. And, you know, it's, that's not what's going to find these things because it hasn't found them for years and years. So we let's talk like, about our, Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead, Kelly. Sorry. I, this just came to me. It's like, we should, you know, bonus audit when they actually find stuff like imagine you know, that would, you know, I know there's the whole incentive and everything, but jokingly, like, you know, it, it'd be like capture the flag or something like that. I, you know? I've actually had this conversation with somebody before. The problem is 
um, you know, then you never get a bonus if you actually work at a good company, right? Like, you know, and so, and we all want to work at that company, which doesn't exist by the way, but anyway, I just. <laughs> well, and I think, I think the other problem, cause I actually like that idea to a certain extent in, in, in theory, but in practice, the other problem was that it, with that is you get a bunch of auditors who would have just a bone to pick and they wouldn't stop until they found something. And that's not good either, but Hey, Let's talk about the whistleblower before we run out of time and then we'll get back to just some other stuff. So the whistleblower actually ended up in a good place after a while, kind of sort of. So Gil now works as chief legal officer for a company called Zipmex and it's a digital assets platform. And he said, it's been so long since I found a place where I can call home professionally. It's been very exciting to me. But this is here's what else is happening to this young man, though. <sighs> he says he has anxiety. Whenever uh, the lift passes by his floor, the elevator, for those of you who are in the Western world, uh, the lift is the elevator. Um, and, and, he, and he says whenever it makes it, whenever the door rattles to the lift, he gets nervous. And, and let's quote him. He said, I always used to get scared. Just hearing that door move would not allow me to sleep. I would know it was not particularly rational, but it still happens. This man has some sort of like almost almost like a PTSD from the experience that he had at this crappy company that treated him badly for simply trying to tell the truth. Crazy. Yeah. When I first read the whistleblower article, which I'll put that in the comments too, um, I was a little, I thought it a little bit kind of pushed people to shy away from being a whistleblower. So when I read the article first, I didn't like it at first. But I mean, obviously, it's very much his experience. Um, and so it's an interesting one. I'll let you guys form your own opinion on it. Uh, but it is, it's, it's scary. But I don't know if presenting it in this light, whoever wrote this article, I forget, uh, is uh, really encouraging whistleblowing. So You know, it, it, it's hard because you want there to be a realistic depiction of what can happen. Right. So it's kind of hard to encourage it without mentioning the cost, because there's definitely a cost. There, look, there is a cost even if you are a person in an organization with too much information. You may not have even blown the whistle, but the fact that you know too much, if you start to become a little bit more vocal than others in meetings, you will have a target on your back at some point. So, well, yeah, that, that's that's a tough one. And he said he took the data and I will tell you, not from anywhere in particular, they were looking at his stuff and they threatened him with you took our data. And there's a little bit of him that went, well, that's right. I did take the da data, but I did it to protect myself and I haven't used it. So, but I know companies will go after that because, I mean, I'm not going to say it was a mistake on his part. I think he felt he did it as protection and he hadn't done anything with it. But legally, if they go to law enforcement and they're like, look, here's his computer. We've had it forensically, you know, uh, looked at and he stole our data and he could get thrown in jail. Yep. Yep. And yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a shame though, because it shows a true lack of moral integrity at this entire organization. The fact that multiple people have not come out now after the fact, even though you were a coward while you were there, because that's what you are. You're a coward. If you didn't, you know, if you saw this and you didn't say anything, even though you were a coward while you were there, now that the story has come out, you should be coming forward because, I mean, this evidence is irrefutable. They finally admitted this company is insolvent. So you can't even say that this man didn't know what he was talking about. I still haven't seen people come forward. And you know why, though? They have a fear that they won't be able to get a job now. You know, and that fear is in two different arenas, right? One, you're a snitch. We don't want to hire you. Or two, at this point, you didn't come forward. So now I'm really questioning your moral and ethical stance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. That people find themselves in after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, 
Now, Pozo says she's had a target on her back in the past. Dan says that IA is no longer gotcha auditing. Agree with that 100%. And then Mark had a really good uh, comment up here that I hope I can find. Uh, Documenting. I think that was it. I, I've lost it now because there, there's been a lot rolling in. I want to thank you guys because uh, I don't know. You, you guys help make this show for, for, for me and I probably for Kelly and Joe, too, because sometimes you wonder if you are a little bit crazy with the things that you see and say. And when we can have this open discussion, you start to realize, no, I'm not crazy for a company to send private investigators after a whistleblower really is crazy. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good one. I think um, Pozo even said wire cards one everybody's heard of, but it is a little bit of a diluted, you know, we all heard about the 2.1 billion in US dollar cash that was missing, but we didn't all hear about the inflated revenues and the fake invoices with the logos and all that. So, I mean, there was, you know, half of revenue, all, you know, it says all of profits were made up, cash was missing. There's just so much with this one. So I know I appreciated you picking this, this story to break it down. This was Kelly. Kelly had this idea. Kelly, thanks for taking this one. Yeah, you know, I love yeah. whistleblowers. Uh, hashtag whistleblowers are heroes. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and so I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier, though. Auditors should always assess the aftermath. Anytime someone in a significant position of authority or even uh, middle management, when they leave abruptly, you need to be looking at that and saying, oh, wait a minute. What truly happen. You, we've seen it time and time again in the cases that we've talked about here. Somebody was there one day, gone the next, and they knew a lot. There was a lot of information and companies were trying to cover up corruption. Yeah, it's um, it's on my list of, of things to do to start auditing culture because nobody everybody tells you to do it, but not how to do it. One of them is you got to become friends with HR because you've got to know what those exit interviews say, what those complaints what? are. Yeah, I know, right? If there are any, uh, but the reason, the reasons people are leaving, you have to investigate that kind of stuff. So I agree 100%. All right. Um, oh, it's that was a quick hour, guys. Yeah, it was. All right. Uh, what I would say at this moment now, Joe, is, is today the day that you have to go now? I have to go. I um, am doing my financial planner ethics, financial planning association ethics presentation. So wish me guys, wish me luck, guys. Um, but yeah, so I'm headed there. Good awesome. luck. So here's what I would say. If there are any more last minute questions, we can get those in and Kelly and I might talk about a few of those uh even joe because it's not until okay never mind and uh if not we will see you guys later heather says good session mark says joe exit interviews are bull crap yes they are they're business bull crap by the way one of the name of one of my other books uh sorry god, <laughs> god. I, I, uh, I urge uh companies to better that process too so we'll see if i can make a difference on that Mark, one day, one day, high aspirations there. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Show me says, good luck, Joe. Thanks. Bye, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. We will uh, see you guys next week.